Elden Ring is a fantastic game and another jewel in From Software's action RPG crown. This review will be as spoiler-free as possible because I think this game contains some of the most striking visuals and environments that I've ever seen in a game. There will be some minor visual spoilers in this video in terms of environments, but I'll try and keep it to a minimum. There were so many moments where I stopped progressing throughout the world just to absorb the beautiful vistas and sights. From Software has always been adept at those elements of presentation, their fantastic art design overcoming their shortcomings and technical prowess. This game is definitely a Souls title at its core, and although there is plenty of new gameplay and environmental concepts, it can feel a bit overly familiar at times for veterans of their last decade of work. Still, to put it simply, I would definitely recommend this game to anyone, and I will continue to elaborate my thoughts in the rest of this video, if you're interested. To provide context for the rest of this review, here's my background with From's last decade or so of games. I purchased Demon's Souls shortly after its US release in 2009, and gradually fell in love with it. It remains one of my all-time favorite games. So many of the concepts we still see in Elden Ring were born in Demon's Souls. Methodical combat, centered around stamina management, featuring a robust RPG character building system. An immersive and oppressive world with glimmers of hope and melancholy beauty. A story that was communicated with both sparse yet effective dialogue and cutscenes, but primarily found within the texts of its world via item descriptions and environmental world building. To perceive the big picture and perhaps the true motives of some of its characters, the game entrusted the player to do a bit of detective work and connect the dots themselves. Plenty has been said on director Hidetaka Miyazaki's visual and storytelling influences, with myself included, so I will leave it at that for this video. But perhaps its most innovative aspect came from the way it handled multiplayer. Cooperative and hostile player encounters all took place within the same world instead of being separated into arbitrary game modes and had convincing lore integrations in order to explain them. This concept of asymmetrical player versus player gameplay remains one of my favorite elements of these games, and when combined with a large amount of possible build variety and side quests that can be undertaken, results in massive amounts of replay value that are created within the organic fusion of unpredictable players engaging with the player versus environment aspects of the games. I've continued to enjoy every Souls title since, as well as of course Bloodborne and Sekiro. I've collectively put in over 1,000 hours into them, something no other game or series, regardless of my love of them, has managed to do. For context, for Elden Ring itself, I've completed one playthrough with a classic strength build that primarily used the classic Claymore, as well as a great bow and great shield on occasion. It took me 98 hours over a little over 3 weeks, and I think I've seen about 70% of the game's content. While writing this review, I have begun a second playthrough with a mage build that feels more dynamic and viable than it has since Dark Souls 1. The art of Elden Ring is frequently beautiful enough to warrant its own video, exploring its style and influences, but I'll share some brief thoughts on it here. Continuing some design choices from Sekiro, the lands between are frequently an extremely colorful and lively place, rich with flora and fauna executed on a near consistently evocative level. Colors are, for the most part, deeply saturated in a way that feels fresh for a From game. The natural landscapes evoke feelings, compositions, and colors similar to the Romanticism art movement that occurred between the late 1700s and early 1800s. The entrance to Liurnia in particular seems like a homage to Caspar David Frederick's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. Romanticism's emphasis on the power of nature and its indifference to man and its scope seem to be a likely reference point in many of the exterior designs of Elden Ring. Crumbling structures and the futility of man in the face of nature, of course a From staple by now, were a consistent theme within many works of art in this period, making it a thematically appropriate fit. Other art influences include the formidable Polish artist Zdzisław Beksinski, sorry about the pronunciation there, in which an entire region of the game seems to be an homage to. Beksinski likely needs little introduction, but was most notable for his nightmarish surrealism, which frequently utilized very lurid, expressionistic palettes. 
Kaelid, the aforementioned region in the game, doesn't go quite as far with its disturbing environmental and enemy designs as Beksinski was willing to go, but a clear influence is visible in the bloody reds and rusts, its rotting landscapes, skeletal mountains, and horrific enemy designs even by From Software's frequently terrifying standards. The final art reference I would like to mention would be Alan Lee, best known for his artwork inspired by J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. He is of course a common reference point for medieval fantasy and has been for decades for artists across the world. Even the art for Demon Souls was clearly influenced by Lee's work. The shining white marbled walls and the towers of Minas Tirith at the foot of a towering mountain seems to be an obvious reference point to Boletaria before its fall. In Elden Ring, this reference continues with dramatically massive architecture to represent the highest achievements of this era's civilization. An interesting twist comes in the form of the specific architectural choices that were utilized for some of the different regions. The lands of the lower demigods primarily feature the same Norman architecture that was used in Boletaria in Demon Souls, representing a more primitive state, more isolated from the splendor of the gods and Queen Merica. Stormvale Castle, the home of Godric the Golden, fittingly, is not only larger than its nearby man-made structures, which utilize a similar architecture, but is accented with golden embroidery, perfect for Godric's illusions of grandeur. As we move forward through the game and reach Lendell, the royal capital, we see a shift to the more grandiose and dramatic Gothic architecture, representing the superiority and advancement of the realm of the demigods, just like we saw in Dark Souls 1 and 3. I can't say too much about the lore of the world itself currently, as I'm still wrapping my head around many of its details, but it's quite obviously influenced by Nordic mythology, featuring Yggdrasil in the form of the Erd Tree, the various realms, including the primary one, the Lands Between, which name fits a similar nomenclature to Midgard, and by extension, Middle-earth. For example, um, I thought that Conceivably, Midgard might be Middle-earth or have some connection. Oh yes, they're the same word. There are nine distinct realms in Nordic mythology and they all get some form of representation here. Perhaps I will elaborate on these connections in a separate video. Let me know in the comments if you're interested. So what's new in Elden Ring? The largest departure the game takes from its predecessors is of course its open world. In interviews regarding the game, both Miyazaki as well as other From Software employees noted that it was perhaps more accurate to describe the title as open field rather than open world. This is perhaps one of the biggest understatements in the history of gaming advertisements and is an example of the trademark modesty of these guys. Elden Ring is absolutely massive. Its collective landmass is probably equivalent to all three Dark Souls games combined, and amazingly, most of that is accomplished with unique, original content. There are, of course, times where elements were reused, most notoriously at this point with some of the bosses, but I felt consistently immersed in that handcrafted feel that has defined their previous titles. The Lands Between is spread over several distinct areas, all with unique biomes and atmospheres. To say much more would be to spoil it, but some of the environments that the game takes place in are very striking and feel very fresh in terms of locale for From Software. Between the Lands Between, you'll encounter legacy dungeons, various ruins, catacombs, mines, towers, and other landmarks. The legacy dungeons are what From has designated the areas with a classic Souls-style level design, featuring interconnected paths, traps, and the spectacle moments that culminate in a climactic boss encounter. Stormvale Castle is the first of these and is massive. It's one of the better areas in the series, with sprawling exploration and well-executed combat encounters. It also has one of my favorite skyboxes, something FromSoft is still the king's at. As mentioned earlier, it calls to mind Boletaria Castle, but this single dungeon is larger and more complex than the entirety of your time spent there in all of its stages in Demon Souls combined. Less successful would be something like the Catacombs, which call to mind the Chalice Dungeons from Bloodborne, but minus the randomization. 
These are Elder Scrolls style mini dungeons that primarily utilize the same graphic assets and layouts. I don't think that these were necessary, and I don't think they play to Fromm's strengths. I still did most of them because they were still usually engaging from a gameplay perspective, but I do think the effort spent could have been better utilized elsewhere. If they had somehow been able to have been randomized like they were in Bloodborne, I think they would have turned out more interesting. The mines that you will frequently encounter are similar, but I think they were generally more interesting thanks to their naturally more organic layouts and greater utilization of verticality in the level design. Plus, they featured my favorite ambient music in the game. To travel all of this massive space, you are given a mount named Torrent shortly after beginning the game. I was initially worried about how this would feel, but my concerns were laid to rest within minutes of riding around. In my opinion, this is the best horseback movement and combat I've ever experienced in a game. The closest comparison I could make to a Souls veteran would be this. Imagine if you could take the sprinting mechanics from the previous titles, but with the ability to turn on a dime, could attack on either your left or right sides, either with a light or chargeable heavy attack that can be released when the moment is right, without breaking your pace, and you had a double jump that had complete redirectional capability while in the air from your first jump. And similar to how the movement mechanics worked while sprinting in previous titles, you were able to freely move both your character in any direction as well as the camera at will. I'm very glad they emphasize control over overly realistic animations and cumbersome articulation. It has that same level of super granular control that your character has, and I think they absolutely nailed it. Some of my favorite boss encounters in the game were done while on horseback, both for jousting type duels with similar mounted opponents, as well as the requisite huge enemy fights. The thrill of the several dragon fights in the game never warned thin for me. The absolute exhilaration of racing full speed just in the nick of time to dodge a massive plume of fire, or double jumping an absolute spectacle of an AoE attack to deliver a slash to the face of my enemy, remain some of the most thrilling gameplay I've ever experienced. The two biggest criticisms I have in regard to Torrent are, number one, he isn't developed as a character after his introduction. I realize we're talking about a horse here, but given the sheer amount of time you spend riding around on him, you would think you would at least get involved in a cutscene or something by the endgame. Unfortunately not. Given some of the game's other similarities to Shadow of the Colossus, I was expecting some kind of emotional payoff with him, or at least an appearance in one of the endings. This leads me to point two. You cannot use him in the final boss fight. This seems like more than a missed opportunity and almost like a mistake. I won't spoil it, but the arena itself is massive, and the boss's moveset feels akin to the several bosses in the game that seem to be designed to be handled on horseback. There was such a great opportunity here for a really climactic moment for Torrent. Remember the endgame bosses from Ocarina of Time? Phase 1 takes Navi away from you, removing the ability to lock on, and both mechanically and thematically removing something significant from the player. Navi returns in Phase 2, which elevates the dramatic impact of the final battle in a really cool way. I would have loved to have seen something like that in Elden Ring, but alas, no. Sorry, Torrent. Ashes of War are another new feature in Elden Ring. It builds on the weapon arts from Dark Souls 3, in which weapons have special moves that consume focus points. In Dark Souls 3, it was an attempt to expand the movesets of melee characters, and a reason to invest in attunement for non-casters. Unfortunately, for the most part, they were somewhat underwhelming and didn't offer much of a worthwhile difference over your standard moveset. Ashes of War builds on the system in a few ways. First of all, they are largely modular in that you can equip them to a wide variety of weapons, which allows for a great degree of customization. Sit at any site of grace, this game's version of a bonfire, and you can quickly change your weapon's Ash of War, and even its current method of stat scaling once you've got the right tools. Secondly, it seems like the average focus point cost is lower than it was in Dark Souls 3, encouraging more frequent usage. Third, and most importantly, they are by and large part significantly more effective than they had been previously, to the extent that one of them, the Horfrost Stomp, has already been adjusted to far more reasonable levels in a recent patch. The flashiness of many of these Ashes of War allow for melee focus builds to enjoy a bit of the spectacle that's usually reserved for caster builds, in addition to expanding your potential moveset. 
The next new mechanic is jumping and jumping attacks. Beginning with Dark Souls 1, the only method of doing a standard jump was after a running sprint, and that was primarily used to clear gaps, not to scale any vertical elements, at least intentionally. The jumping attacks that started with Dark Souls 1 had you press up and heavy attack simultaneously, which was effective but not exactly dynamic in terms of controlling your movement while in the air. With Sekiro, From Software added a dedicated jump button that also incorporated it into the combat. Sekiro's emphasis on clashing swords and duels meant that the dodge and jump were sometimes secondary to the deflection mechanic, but it was still there, and it was still a nice change of pace that differentiated it from Souls combat. This has made its way into Elden Ring, and you're able to utilize light attacks, heavy attacks, and even dual wield attacks while airborne. That's right, this game has proper dual wielding, it's finally back from Dark Souls 2. You also automatically perform special dual attacks with L1 while carrying a matching weapon type in each hand. The jumping attacks tie into another of From's attempts to diversify the combat a bit instead of relying primarily on light attacks. Guard breaking was a concept in the earlier games, but usually only when an opponent was defending with a shield up, or the like. Similar to Sekiro, enemies have a hidden posture meter that, when broken, puts them in a stunned state for a visceral attack. Heavy attacks and jump attacks build this meter much faster than light attacks, and in my first playthrough I found myself using this technique frequently, especially on bosses. Jumping also deactivates the hitboxes for your character's legs, allowing you to leap over certain attacks and immediately follow up with a punish. It feels great. Jumping also leads to more dynamic level design possibilities while scaling both man-made and organic environments, and this is utilized to great degree as well. Guard counters are another new element with shields that encourages more aggressive and more dynamic melee combat. Separate from parries, a guard counter is performed by immediately pressing heavy attack following a shield block. You hear a sound effect and are rewarded with a fast attack that is more damaging than your standard light or heavy attack. Shield stamina in general has been returned to Dark Souls 1 and 2 levels and can now be more reliably used throughout the game again, especially if you utilize some of the several shield-specific Ashes of War. Together, these elements go a long way into providing a more dynamic combat experience than has been found in any of the Souls games so far. Stealth was utilized in a simple but effective manner in Sekiro, and it returns here in basically the same format. You can crouch to hide behind tall grass in various cover, and if you sneak up on an enemy, you are rewarded with either a visceral attack or a more damaging version of any of your standard attacks. You can still distract enemies and get them to face away with projectiles, just like the older games too. I found stealth to be a cool, non-intrusive mechanic. It's never required, but it can certainly make some sections quite a bit easier. Two examples would be sneaking around a soldier encampment and stealth killing one by one, or in a section that featured archers that would make the Anna Orlando catwalk guys blush, utilizing various rocks and trees to avoid damage and get some optimal positioning. Taking them on by running at them blindly was suicide. Stealthing around was not only rewarding, but a cool, new feeling experience for the series. Let's talk about crafting. Elden Ring's crafting is pretty painless. First of all, it's completely optional. There's never a single situation where it's required. Secondly, the actual collection mechanics of it are extremely seamless. You pick up craftables with no animation and can even be moving full speed on your horse while doing so, simply by tapping the use button as you go flying by. You can craft items at any time outside of combat in a submenu that again has no animations or progress bars to wait for, None of that. There is no crafting level system or anything either. Your available craftable items depend solely on the materials and the recipe books that you can find and buy throughout the world. I usually found myself crafting at times that I was also leveling up at a side of grace, or taking care of business in this game's hub area, and producing things like weapon greases, poison darts, antidotes, and food for torrent. Overall, I think it was executed well. Spirit Summons are another new addition. They are essentially friendly NPC summons that will fight alongside you. There is a large variety of them in the game, many of which are based on the enemies you'll encounter along the way. They have a major advantage over the traditional summoning system in that they don't increase the health of boss fights you take them into. Sometimes it can turn an extremely challenging fight into a much easier affair simply from them pulling aggro, but plenty of them are massive damage dealers in their own right. 
The Mimic tier Spirit Ash was definitely the best choice at launch, but a recent patch dialed them back to a more reasonable level, encouraging greater diversity in your summon selection. Before the patch, they were literally capable of soloing some bosses. I've seen some discourse online that utilizing the Spirit Ashes is cheating, or that it's some kind of easy mode. I don't agree. Elden Ring is some of the toughest boss fights in any From game, and there are many which feature multiple adversaries. The fact is, is that summons have been an encouraged component of these games since Demon Souls. Over time, From has added summonable NPCs to the games, allowing offline players to still utilize that assistance. The Spirit Ash system is just a more dynamic version of that, allowing you to fine-tune an element to your character's build, just like infusions and other synergy mechanics. The trade-off for summoning players and traditional NPCs is the boss health increase, but the majority of the time, it was still a worthwhile trade considering the average intelligence of a human player versus the AI. I do feel a little conflicted about utilizing them, personally, only because I prefer a straight 1v1 and not whacking a boss in the back while an AI keeps pulling out. Agro. Not utilizing Spirit Ashes in Elden Ring will certainly add another level of challenge to some fights, but I didn't find it either required or that it completely ruined the challenge either way, which leads me to my next point. The bosses in Elden Ring are a bit hard to talk about for a few reasons. There are more of them in it than any of their previous games, but many of them are repeated. There is usually some element of difference, but similar to Sekiro, you will fight a few of them several times. I didn't find this to be too much of an issue in terms of immersion. For the most part, the repeat fights make sense as they usually belong to a group that would have several members, to put it as vaguely as possible. There were some notable exceptions to this that I feel were a mistake in terms of world cohesion and immersion, but I didn't necessarily mind from a pure gameplay perspective. But a special mention must be made to the Erd Tree Avatar, which is the Asylum Demon from Dark Souls 1, who was already reused several times in that game, came back again in Dark Souls 3, and is repeated here several times. There are still big, climactic, and memorable fights featuring introductory and halftime cutscenes that emphasize their significance and power like the previous Souls titles. These, as mentioned earlier, are some of the toughest From has ever made. After my first playthrough, however, I don't think I found these big story fights collectively, and emphasis on collectively here, as memorable as some of the previous games. Don't get me wrong, there are some real highlights and jaw droppers, but I do think overall the mandatory bosses are a bit of a step down from Dark Souls 3, both in terms of their movesets and that wonderful climactic feeling that results from that intersection of lore, presentation, and music. Speaking of music, unfortunately, I am left feeling similar regarding the soundtrack to Elden Ring. Like the bosses, there are definitely several very memorable pieces. Elden Ring, in contrast to the Souls titles, features ambient music for every one of its areas. I only found a few of these to be memorable. For example, the tunnels theme, Kaelid, the underground areas, and a few others. Those are some wonderful tracks. I'm sad to say it, but I found many of the other ambient tracks to be various degrees of uninspired. Some of the legacy dungeon themes feel as though they are essentially two minor key chords alternating with minimal instrumentation and dynamics and not much else. I understand that balancing something that is melodically compelling without growing aggravating after hearing it loop several times is a tall order, but the fact is is that most of these pieces are three minutes or less anyway. It's disappointing in comparison to the tracks that I did find in engaging and memorable, not just in this game, but considering all of the wonderful ambient tracks you occasionally did get in the Souls games, or even further back, the Kingsfield titles. The boss music is pretty much what you'll be expecting if you've played Dark Souls 3 or Bloodborne. Lots of orchestral bombast, Latin choirs, etc. Some of it is more successful than others, but I again have a hard time remembering most of it compared to previous titles. The most successful pieces in this category are the ones that are out of the ordinary. The Ancestor Spirit boss music is probably the best example of this, featuring instrumentation that feels new to the series, as well as a contemplative, beautiful vibe. A similar thing with Renala. I adore the final boss music too, both phases, but for reasons that I won't spoil. Overall, solid, but again, not collectively on the level of the previous games.
Multiplayer is not in the best place right now. Beyond frequent general connectivity issues, bleed builds are extremely overpowered, to the extent that the grand majority of invasions and duels you'll encounter will probably be utilizing them. Dark Souls 3 got some flack for straight sword R1s being so good, but this is a bigger issue in my opinion. This is one of the easier things to fix if From is so inclined, fortunately. Beyond that, Invasions are now limited to opt-in when solo, or when you've got a co-op partner or two present. This means the majority of invasions you'll enter will be a 1 versus 3 scenario, and when combined with the aforementioned popularity of bleed builds, it leads to some pretty frustrating scenarios. Finally, and this isn't from software's fault, it feels like the general player base level of communication is even more toxic and obnoxious than it was in Dark Souls 3. For example, getting teabagged, now possible thanks to the crouching mechanic, after getting massacred in a 1v3, or how 9 out of 10 messages are the same played out joke you've been seeing for the last decade of these games, it's wearing pretty thin for me. Illusory wall ahead, in front of every wall, dry finger butthole, every 5 feet. It's just getting a little played out. I've been playing Elden Ring offline unless I'm specifically trying to engage with the multiplayer aspects as a result. My biggest critique of Elden Ring, however, would be the moments in which I felt a great sense of deja vu in regards to specific moments, visual set pieces, or elements of the setting and lore. Elden Ring certainly features a large amount of new concepts, locations, and visuals that haven't been seen in a From Software game before, but it also has quite a few moments that were a bit deflated for me because I felt like I had seen them before in not only a previous games, but multiple previous games. It's a bit hard to give specific examples here without spoiling too much, but one relatively non-spoiler example I can show you is this Windmill Village, which is very similar to Hemlock Charnel Lane from Bloodborne. The design of the village itself is very similar, but what really gets me are the enemies populating it. The demented old women wearing aprons and laborer attire, singing and dancing around as if in a trance. But beyond this, as I mentioned, there are quite a few big story beats, character archetypes, and visuals which felt very similar. It seems somewhat ironic given both the finality and the meta element of Dark Souls 3. This world is dying, we can't keep repeating ourselves. Yes, we got the message loud and clear. You guys want to move on from Dark Souls. Yet, Elden Ring, both in gameplay and setting, is still so similar in many ways. Did they really just mean the specifics of the lore? Because again, that's pretty similar in many aspects too. Even the main theme of the game, which I do enjoy by the way, is couched between what sounds a lot like Gwyn's theme from Dark Souls, and the main musical theme from Demon Souls. How much of these feelings are deliberate reflections and callbacks, and how many of them are a lack of new ideas? I'm hoping that their next project, after the supposedly in development Armored Core 6, which I am very much looking forward to, is something really new again. Not even something like Bloodborne, as great as that was, where the gameplay was still largely similar to Souls despite the change in setting. Maybe return to a first-person perspective a la Kingsfield? Maybe it's time to make their first proper horror game in 20 years. They've certainly proved their skill in that regard. I've talked about this before in other videos, but the Dark Souls trilogy, and now Elden Ring, take place in various realms of the gods featuring impossibly massive cathedrals, vistas, and sites. The lore in these games, while still retaining some relatable, metaphorical elements, have largely been focused on the trials and tribulations of the casts of supernatural beings that are more similar to the Greek gods, Arthurian legend, now Nordic myth, or in the case of Bloodborne, Lovecraft and his unknowable cosmic entities. It would be cool to return to something a bit more grounded, especially if they could manage to incorporate the level of more relatable human metaphor and dramatic irony that I found to be such a compelling element of the world of Demon Souls. The last few sections may have suggested I wasn't as keen on Elden Ring as I was at the beginning of the video, but don't get the wrong idea. I love this game, and I plan on replaying it for many years to come. It's one of my favorite games of all time. The number one aspect of Elden Ring that I found so successful was the remarkable sense of adventure, 
exploration, and discovery that I experienced while playing it. It took me back to feelings I had while playing Link to the Past on my SNES as a little kid. It stimulated a sense of adventurous imagination in ways that games rarely have for me. The only things that have come close since then are Ocarina of Time, Wind Waker, and basically Fromm's other games. It's the kind of game that I couldn't stop thinking about when I wasn't playing it. To get that feeling again felt really special. In 2009, when I was in college and I was starting to branch out into many other hobbies in my life outside of gaming, it seemed like the writing was on the wall as far as the beginning of the end of the golden age of gaming, and as far as I was concerned, maybe my interest in keeping up with the scene too. And then I heard about a little game called Demon's Souls. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> Since then, I can always count on a truly top-notch experience from From Software. I think Elden Ring continues that legacy and is another feather in the cap of the company that, in my opinion, is the best modern game developer. That's all for this time. Thank you for watching.